So this is class 141 on the Golden Doves. We are on page uh, 79, and for those of you who are new, uh, welcome to Torah Tandalus. Um, we teach Torah on this channel in a very unique fashion. Um, it's unique because on the one hand, we are uh, following the authentic traditions of Harambam and Hakmei Andalusia, um, and we hold those dear to our uh, heart. But on the other hand, um, we also try to present things in an intelligent fashion. And the very subject matter that we're discussing, Golden Doves and Silver Dots, is a very uh, sophisticated um, study of linguistics. And the Hakamim were concerned with linguistics. So you see how, on the one hand, ideas in modern linguistics can impact upon our understanding of the Hakamim, right? So that's what we're doing here with these Golden Doves classes, for example. And, and for those of you who didn't yet subscribe, I would appreciate it if you do subscribe because it does help the channel, it helps the YouTube uh, algorithm. The more people subscribe, the more that uh, YouTube would um, promote this, these classes. So please uh, do subscribe, do press the like button. I know it sounds trite, but uh, for purposes of Tamil Torah, um, I think it's um, worth uh, my asking. So let's uh, go to page 78. We can now, on the bottom of the page, we can now proceed to examine the basic principle concerning Maimonides' linguistic theory. There you go again. Linguistic theory of Aramba. Right? So you need to understand linguistics. According to Maimonides, all attributes referring to God himself must be interpreted in negative terms. That's interesting. Anything that the Torah says about God must be interpreted negatively. So you say, um, Ha'el ha'gadol, ha'gadol bo. I mean, God doesn't really exist in space. How can you say he's big? So what you're saying is, well, he's not, of course, he's not small, right? So that's what you mean when you say, el agadol, right? Um, or uh, el agadol, la gibo. Uh, God is powerful. So power is um, sort of like a force. You know, usually we associate power with like a physical force, but, but God is completely non-physical. So how can you say he's gibo? So you mean to say, that he doesn't lack ability, right? Um, for instance, attributes such as one, even when you say God is one, what do you mean one? You don't mean it in a mathematical sense because mathematics refers to things that exist in our plane of existence. God's existence is something dramatically different and above our existence, right? Eternal, right? So you say that God exists forever. But what does forever mean? Forever is a time measure. But there is no time for God, right? So yet God is eternal. But what do you mean by that? There's no time for God. So you mean that there was no point where there was no uh, existence of God. Living. Uh, so life, all life depends on something. It depends, for example, biological life forms depend on certain circumstances, certain environmental conditions, right? Um, so things are alive because something allows them to be alive also. Um, as something is, is alive, theoretically can then be dead, right? Um, there's life versus death, it's a binary. So the point being that we don't mean that in the sense that we're alive, God is alive, right? God's life is something that transcends um, the living, right? So all these things are to be interpreted as not multiple. So one means there aren't many of him, right? Eternal. Eternal is to be understood as not created, right? God is the bore, he's not nivra, right? That's what we mean by eternal. Living, we mean not dead, right? For the reasons that I explained. The same applies to all other personal attributes such as almighty, omniscient, and merciful. So when they said, for example, Hashem is um, uh, Rahum, right? What do we mean by Hashem is Rahum, right? So we mean, of course, that he's not Akhzari, because um, usually Rahmanut is a feeling. It's a type of feeling that overcomes a person or individual or thinking person when he's confronted with, with a particular circumstance. So we don't mean that Hashem is Rahum in that way when we say Hashem is Rahum. God can only be perceived negatively as what he is not, but never as what he is, right? So that's the idea of negative theology, the idea of negative theology, or again, 
understanding of God. We can understand what God isn't, but do we really understand what he is in a positive sense? Negativity in this case follows from two closely related premises. First, there is a categorical difference between God and his creation. So, so in order to understand why for Hanabam, and for us, right, and for anybody who thinks about the matter, it shouldn't just be Hanabam. Hanabam is the one who wrote about it most. But, right? So the reason it's so important, the negative understanding of God is, first of all, there is a categorical difference between God and us. The, the difference is not a difference in, in, in uh, amount and quantity. It's, it's a difference in essence. It's a difference in the very beingness, right? So first, there is a categorical difference between God and his creatures, his, his creatures. Because his creatures are created. God is not created. So of course, the difference is an absolute categoric difference. According to Hanabam in the Mole. Absolutely. There is no likeness between him and his creatures in anything. His existence is not like their existence. His life is not like the life of those who live. And his knowledge is not like the knowledge of those who know. So in all these things, Harambam's, you know, we use um, uh, what Harambam is saying in all these things is that you know, we use language, right? But language in this case is pointing out to something beyond the language, right? Because we really don't understand when we see God is alive, what does that exactly mean? You know? Since this concept of creation rejects any ontological relationship between God and his creatures, let me explain that. When my father says this concept of creation, he's saying Beri yesh me'ayin. Means that there is an infinite difference between the Bore, the creator of God, and the Nibra, the universe, because there was nothing there but God, right? So there's an absolute chasm between the pre created world, which is only God, and the post Bereshit Bara world, which is God and the creations. So that only God state, right, is something we can never understand, right? Because it's very ayesh there is nothing in the very ah that allows us somehow to comprehend what the pre very ah is. We refer to it as ayin, nothing, in the sense that we really don't. There was nothing from the created world that's in the pre created world. So, that's this concept of creation, rejects any ontological relation between God and his creatures. There was no relationship ontological of beingness in me of God. Again, the idea of helek elokame mima, they say elok, okay, I'm saying it. It's, 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 it's sacrilegious. You know, if you believe God is part of you, I mean, that's, that's, that's Christianity. That's why the, the Christians, they have the notion that you know, the, 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 the obscene, bizarre, macabre notion that God impregnated a woman, right? So if you believe in chelik and okamimah, you would feel comfortable with the Christian notion of God impregnating a woman, and then that woman got pregnant, uh, pregnant and gave birth to God himself. Um, there is no ontological, real, essential connection between our beingness and God's beingness, right? So this whole notion of, you know, God is part of us, God is, no, he's not. Of course he's not part of you. He doesn't exist in your realm of existence. Or perhaps it's us, who, we don't exist in his realm of existence. Right? So there's a categoric and unbridgeable abyss separating God from the cosmos he created. You understand? That otherwise it wouldn't be very ayesh me'ayin. And that's what Harambam says. I mean, this is the Harambam. I mean, I know people may hear this and they may not like it, and they're like, maybe I'll even get a thumbs down, like a dislike, uh, as I do sometimes. That's okay. Um, uh, you know, because the point of these classes is not to make people like me. The point of these classes is to teach Torah, and this is what Harambam writes, right? And there was no greater Jewish thinker than Harambam. I mean, nobody even came close to Harambam. So, 
that this is his, right? And, and that's probably why people dislike Karambam also, because people didn't reach the intellectual level to understand Karambam and to understand God because they were connected with the Christian world. So because they were connected with the Christian world, they had a Christian notion of God, comes Karambam and says, no, no, we reject the Christian notion of God. There was a Jewish notion of God. And that I think might have been too much for some people. So they gave him dislikes as well. Um, so really important to understand this. Again, there was a categoric and unbridgeable abyss separating God from the cosmos that he created. This difference is both ontological and epistemological, meaning at the ontological level, there is nothing else or there is nothing in us that is part of the pre-creation world. The pre-creation world, all there was was God. So God's existence is completely independent of our existence. It needs nothing. Our existence requires creation. So it's an unbridgeable abyss between us and God, but also at the, epist at the epistemological level in our thinking. Because of that, we can't really understand God, right? Even Moshe Rabbeinu, you can see the back of God. Oh, we don't understand God. Even Moses, it's unbridgeable. It's impossible. Okay, the second premise is, one second. Um, did I skip? No, I didn't skip. Right, okay, so the second premise is that as a consequence of the above, there is no common ma'ana between God and his creatures. So, because we um, understand that there's right, and therefore there is no ontological relation between, between us and God or, or epistemological connection between us and God, we get to the second premise, which is there is no common mana between God and his creatures. Right? God's perspective and understanding and conception of the world is something beyond anything we can understand. We can't understand how God understands. We can't understand how God views things. We can't understand how God conceptualizes the world. Even to use the word conceptualizes the world itself is a fallacy. So there is no common mana between God and us. Um, concern, and this is from the, we're going to read a quote from the Moneda Bukhim now. Concerning whether there can be any relationship between, relation, I'm sorry, there, there could be a relationship, of course, we're talking about relation, between them, God, and his creatures. It may appear that such a relationship exists. Okay, so he uses the word relationship in the sense of connection. However, this is not the case. Since it is impossible, for example, to conceive of any relation between reason and color. Is there a relation between reason, logical thinking, and color? Well, no, it's two just completely different realms, right? Although in our minds, both of them are perceived as belonging to the same class of existence, even though um, a lot, you know, reasoning is part of our class of existence, color is part of our class of existence, and yet any intelligent person will tell you there is no relation between class, um, uh, color and, um, and reasoning. How then would it be possible to conceive of a relation with one God who has no mana in common with the others? There is no mana connecting God with the creations. So how can you possibly think there's somehow a relation between God and the creations. So again, Chelek Eloah Mimal is completely foreign to Judaism. Right? That will stop here.